Welcome to our weekly Church on the Rock podcast. For more information, visit us at churchak.org, download our Church on the Rock AK app, or like us on our Facebook page. Thank you for listening, and we hope you enjoy our weekly podcast. Hey, um, love, live, lead. This is our mission as a church, why we exist in the world. And Church on the Rock exists for this purpose, to develop, help develop, provide opportunities for developing a particular kind of person. Someone who loves God authentically, loves others unconditionally. Did you catch that part, the unconditionally piece? That's the tricky part. Uh, Loves God authentically, loves others unconditionally, lives with passion, purpose, and freedom in Christ. And here's the last piece leads through disciple-making. Disciple-making is kind of a funny term. Maybe you've heard this term before, discipleship. And discipleship isn't actually a word, just in case you're wondering. Like, if you punch it into your phone, it's going to put a little red line underneath it. But it's a word we used a lot in the church. We still use a lot in the church. But it's a little bit of a confusing word, to be entirely honest. Like, what does it mean to make disciples? And this is something I've spent a fair amount of time thinking about because, well, it's central to the mission of the church. But I want to start by just making this caveat before we jump into this topic. Because I've learned over the years when I've taught on disciple making um, and this particular approach to disciple making that people often hear something I'm not saying Often when I talk about a Jesus model of disciple making, and I give some characteristics for, to be specific, of that kind of relationship, people often hear you saying that whatever they're currently doing, whatever ministry they're involved in, isn't disciple making. I just want you to understand, there are all kinds of ways to be engaged and involved in the mission of making disciples, You could be involved in um, worship ministry. You could be up preaching and teaching, but there's something unique and specific, and I think Jesus actually meant something specific when he gives the mission to go and make disciples to his disciples. So I want you to hear this for what it actually is, and I am not saying that nothing else that we do in the church is disciple-making. But Church on the Rock exists to develop people who love God love others, live with passion, purpose, and freedom in Christ, and lead through disciple-making. Now, disciple-making can sound like a little bit of a scary term, I think, if you didn't grow up in the church or if you feel as though you're imperfect in some way, which is, well, I don't know, probably all of us, right? Which brings me to influencers. It's an interesting term. If you've heard the term before in association with um, Instagram or social media, influencers are sort of basically broken down into three categories, right? These really significant influencers, these macro influencers, and then these micro influencers. But it's kind of a weird thing. In fact, I I have a family member, my wife's uh, sister, Jody. She actually um, has an Instagram that is House on Sugar Hill, and she just started like remodeling her home and has 86,000 followers now. 86,000 people want to watch her remodel her kitchen 17 times. Like, it's a, she is making a living off of remodeling her house now because people are so intrigued by it and so engaged with it and they are learning and they're enjoying her personality and all of those kinds of things. Influencers are identified as these people who have unique influence in society and culture. Therefore, businesses want to support them when they use their products. Now, here's the interesting thing when you think about influencers, because you and I may not think of ourselves as influencers. I think I have um, seven followers on Instagram. I don't even know how they got there. Um, But the reality is we are all have influence. Every person in this room and watching online has influence with someone in their life. Maybe you're a school teacher, maybe you're just an older sibling, maybe you're a parent, maybe you're a manager 
at work. Maybe it's just in a friend group in which you're the influencer. But the truth of the matter is that there are influencers sitting right here in this room. And influence is defined in this way. The capacity to have an effect on the character, development, or behavior of someone or something. And here's what you need to know. Influence equals power. Now, we don't like the term power in the church much, but there's nothing inherently wrong with the term power. In fact, often when we hear the term power, we think about corruption because absolute power corrupts absolutely, right? But the truth of the matter is you were created to have power. And power is often displayed through the influence that you have in the lives of others. I want you to think for a moment, just of a few names. Who is it that you have influence over in your life? Jesus, when he is talking with his disciples, this is the last thing he's going to say to them. This is what we often refer to as the Great Commission, and it's found in Matthew chapter 28. I want to take a look at it together. Matthew 28, verse 16. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. I want to remind you, Jesus has already been resurrected from the dead. He's already appeared to the disciples on numerous occasions, and now he's going to appear to them one last time. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. It's an interesting thing to say. Like, we're talking about the resurrected (laughs) Jesus. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe. Like, he was dead, and now he's alive, and he has the scars to prove it, the wounds to prove it. He's appeared on several occasions, but now they're gathered there with Jesus, and they all see him, but some of them still doubt. They don't doubt that he's been resurrected from the dead. What they doubt is, does he actually have the authority that he claims that he has? Is he actually who he says he is? And Jesus came and said to them, all, can you say all? All. Now, now in the original Greek, all means all, (laughs) which is a lot. All authority in heaven and on where? Earth. Earth. That pretty much covers it, right? Like if he, if he wanted to get any more specific, I don't know that he could. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus is not afraid or ashamed to acknowledge that he has power. The question is, how will you leverage the power that you have for the good of others? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Here it comes. So with that in mind, go for that reason, because I have all the power and all the authority. Here's the mission I'm going to hand off to you and empower you to accomplish. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And then he is taken up in a cloud and ascends out of sight. And the disciples are just standing there flabbergasted. In fact, we're told in the passage a little bit later that they stand gazing up into the sky like, I can still see him, he's so tiny now. Like, an angelic being has to appear to them and say, what are you doing gazing into the sky? Did you not hear what the man just said? Go make disciples. Now, I would love it as a pastor If I could just this morning get all of us together and say, listen, here's the mission. Here's what you got to be doing. Here's what you're to be involved in. Go make disciples. Everywhere you go with everyone you know, go make disciples. Teach them to observe everything Jesus commanded us. Baptize them. Amen. Let's close with a word of prayer. 
You know what stood out to me in this passage over the years? Is that none of the disciples asked Jesus a single question. Like, I can, I can imagine it now and in my mind. It, it, like, Peter is the guy, right? Peter's the guy who's always asking questions. He's like, foot in the mouth, Peter. He doesn't have any qualms about asking questions. He doesn't even think to think, stop to think if they're stupid questions or not. He just blurts out whatever pops into his head. But in this moment, when Jesus tells him, hands him the greatest mission of all time, go make disciples, nobody asks a single question. Okay, I could see Peter, right? Like, uh, none of you are going to ask, I will. What do you mean? How do we do that? Like, so, so what should we do now? How do we accomplish this mission? But if I just told you today, you showed up and I said, hey, listen, here we go. You ready? Go make disciples. Jesus has all the power. Let's close the word of prayer. You go get in your car and be like, why did we show up today? I have no idea what I'm supposed to do. Because when you ask people what it means to make disciples, you will get 10 different answers from 10 different people. And yet I think fundamentally, the reason Jesus' disciples didn't ask any questions is because they knew exactly what he meant when he said, go make disciples. You know how they knew? Because it's what he had just done with them over the past three and a half years. They weren't at all confused. What Jesus was saying to his disciples is, what I've done with you, I want you now to go and do with others. He had invited them to come and follow him, to be his Talmudim, his disciples, and they had left everything and followed Jesus. And for the past three and a half years, he had modeled for them what it looked like to be in disciple-making relationships. Now, there are lots of characteristics of disciple-making relationships in Jesus' day that are radically different than they are in our day, but there are some things that are the same, which brings me to WDJD. I know it's not near as popular a bracelet as the other ones were, but I think I'm going to make a fortune off of it, and it's this. What did Jesus do? Because we actually have an account in this case. We have it in each of the Gospels, as a matter of fact. We have an account of how Jesus lived life with these individuals that he had influence with. And what he's inviting them to do is now just to go and do the same thing that I've done with you. And so over the years, a couple of friends and I have sat down and we've said, what are the characteristics of a Jesus model of disciple making? What are the things that transcend time and culture that anybody, anywhere could do that Jesus did with his disciples? And what we landed on are four characteristics of disciple making. First one is found in Matthew chapter 4, and maybe you've seen this passage before and thought it was odd. I remember, anybody remember like before the new Jesus movies came out, like the chosen that are like super cool. And the old ones had um, Jesus sort of dressed in this long white robe and he had a blue sash and he looked like he was, you know, from California or something, <laughs> not Middle Eastern. And, and it was like, you know, beauty pageant Jesus walking down the beach and he stops by these fishermen. He says, come follow me. Oh, and they drop everything. I don't know if you've spent any time around commercial fishermen. I was a commercial fisherman for several years. I can just tell you this. If I wandered out onto the docks one day while everyone was out there doing boat work and I was like, come, follow me. Someone would throw something or shoot a flare at me or like, like what are you, this guy's a nut. But Jesus like just drifts up to these guys Come, follow him. And they drop everything and follow him. Now, I want to give this just a little bit of context first because this isn't the first encounter they've had with Jesus. As a matter of fact, they've been out fishing all night long and they have caught zero fish. I have had those seasons out on the fishing grounds where I got home and I owed my skipper money for food and fuel instead of making any money. They are pretty discouraged. They've been up all night long. They're probably a little hangry at this point. 
And Jesus shows up, and there's a multitude of people following him. They know instantly who this guy is. He's a rabbi. He's a teacher. And he shows up on the beach, and this crowd is pressing in all around him. And it's so crowded that the people in the back can't hear him. And so he turns to these guys who are mending their nets, working on their gear, getting ready to go home and get a little bit of sleep because they've caught no fish, made no money the night before. And he says to them, could I get in your boat? We could push off from the shore a little bit, and then everyone could hear me teach just fine. And they say, whatever. And so they do, he gets into the boat of Peter, and and Peter pushes off from the shore a little ways, and Jesus is now teaching the crowd from out in the amphitheater on the water, and he's teaching the crowd, and when he's all done teaching with one, as one who has great authority, when he's all done teaching, then then he says to the disciples, well, the yet-to-be disciples, hey, have you guys tried catching any fish on the other side here? Yeah, no, we hadn't thought of that. Like, thanks, carpenter. (laughs) Seriously, I mean, who is this guy? Great, you you taught with power, you taught with, that was awesome, that was all really good, but you're not a fisherman. We are, we've been fishing here all night long, and we've caught nothing. And this is what Peter says, nevertheless, because you've asked it, I'll do it. And so they cast their net into the water, and take in a haul of fish at the wrong time in the wrong place that is more than they can handle. The nets begin to tear, and so their co-op buddies come paddling out, and they help bring in all of the fish, and then Peter just falls on his knees, and he says, stay away from me. I am unclean. I am unworthy to be around you. It's in that context that Jesus says this, Matthew 4, verse 18. One day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, also called Peter and Andrew, throwing their net into the water, for they fished for a living. And Jesus called out to them, Come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. A little further up the shore, he saw two other brothers, James and John, sitting in a boat with their father, Zebedee, repairing their nets. You know why they're repairing their nets? Because we're told that they were tearing the nets as they were trying to bring in the load of fish. And he called to them, come too. And they immediately followed him, leaving the boat and their father behind. I can just tell you this, that is not a sad statement or a disrespectful statement. Dad Zebedee is cheering for his boys to be called into this mission to go and make disciples. And here's what you need to know. The sheer fact that they're out fishing with their father tells us something culturally about them. That at some point in the process of becoming disciples, of their education, somewhere along the line, some rabbi had told them that they weren't smart enough, they weren't good enough to do what he did. And the language that would be used if you weren't good enough to get into university under the rabbis is go home and learn to ply your family trade. Whatever it is that your dad does, that's what you should go do because you don't have what it takes to do what I do. And so that's where they are, learning to do whatever it is that their father does. And Jesus deliberately and intentionally picks the not good enoughs to come and follow him. The first characteristic of a disciple-making relationship that I see in the life of Jesus with his disciples is this. Disciple-making is invitational. Invitations are powerful things. My girls get invited to birthday parties, and if only one of them gets the invitation, you can rest assured that everyone will know that they got an invitation to the party. But invitations are powerful because people want to belong. And the kingdom of heaven is designed so that everyone could belong. 
You could be invited in. And Jesus is inviting these disciples, which was backwards. It was the complete opposite of every other disciple-making relationship in their day. Because in their day, if you wanted to be discipled, you went to the rabbi and you asked if he would allow you to follow him. But in this case, Jesus shows up on the scene and he extends the invitation to them. He takes the initiative and extends the invitation, which, by the way, is characteristic of God. God has been a God of invitation since the creation of the world. We're told in the Garden of Eden, he invites Adam and Eve to come and walk with him in the garden in the cool of the day. When Adam and Eve fall into sin, he shows up on the scene and invites them back into redemptive relationship and covers them with sacrificial skins. God has been inviting since the creation of the world and all the way into the book of Revelation where it says the spirit and the bride say, come, God is a God who has extended an invitation to you and I. And when we extend that invitation to others, we are modeling the heart of the Father. Disciple making is invitational. In John 15, verse 16, Jesus will say it this way to his disciples, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. This is not a statement on eternal security or predestination or those kinds of things. This is actually a statement by Jesus that is a very pragmatic statement. He says, just remember, I invited you into this thing. You didn't choose me. You didn't come to me as the rabbi you wanted to follow. I invited you into this relationship because there is power and invitation. And in every single circumstance, Jesus is the one who invited them into the relationship. Which brings me to, hello, my name is... Several years ago, a good friend of mine, Aaron Weiser, and I, as we're wrestling through what does it mean to make disciples, what are the characteristics of a disciple-making relationship, as we're wrestling through those things, we're sitting at a coffee shop, and Aaron takes me to this passage, Matthew chapter 10. And just so you know, Aaron's brilliant. He's really, really sharp. And anytime he asks me a question, I know there's a question behind the question. I know he's already figured something out, and my job is to try and guess until I get it right. At Matthew chapter 10... These, uh, the names of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Aaron looks over at me and he says, what do you notice about this list? They have names. There's 12. They're men. They're all men. Is that what it is? Nope. That's not what it is. They're all Jewish. Nope. That's not what it is. They have different occupations. Nope. That's not what it is. Fine, Aaron. Just tell me, what is it? What's the, what's the awesome thing you've noticed in this passage that I'm clearly missing? And this is what Aaron says to me. In all seriousness, he looks at me and he says, they all had names. Really? That was it? That's, at least I got coffee out of this deal. He says, here's what I've noticed over the years. If you ask Christians, people who have been Christians for a long time, people who have said yes to the mission of making disciples, people who believe that discipleship is important, if you ask people if they're discipling someone, they will sometimes say yes, but if you ask them this question, what are their names? It goes strangely silent. Are you discipling anyone? Oh, yeah, I'm discipling someone. You know why I'm saying yes to that? Because Jesus said we have to disciple people. Okay, so who are you discipling? What are their names? Well, uh, there's lots of people. Right? We don't do that with our kids, you know, unless you have 17 kids, uh, right? Like, do you have any kids? Yeah, I have kids. Well, what are their names? Well, we have lots of kids. Uh. Um, 
Jim? No. I mean, I forget my kids' names frequently. I don't forget their names. I just forget which name belongs to which kid. Like, I run through the list, right? And it's like, listen, Olivia, Katie... Addy, yes, you're Addy. Um, but the reality is, when you ask people, are you discipling someone, even if they say yes, then you ask them, what are their names? If you asked Jesus, are you discipling anyone? Jesus would say, yes. And if you said, what are their names? He would say, well, would you turn with me to Matthew chapter 10? No, because <laughs> they didn't exist. Uh, he'd say, well, these are their names, right? I mean, there's Simon. I'm calling him Peter. He's the rock or the pebble, right? He, he could list the name. More importantly, if you asked the disciples, is someone discipling you? They would say yes, and they know who it is. Are you discipling someone, and do they know that you're discipling them? Because disciple-making relationships and Jesus' model aren't simply invitational, they're also individual. That's why for me as a pastor, I don't count this, standing up on a Sunday and preaching and teaching, as my ultimate fulfillment of the mandate to make disciples. If I'm not involved in individual relationships where I have invited someone into a disciple-making relationship, then this doesn't fulfill that part of the mandate for me. And here's the other thing I've discovered. I find more life in those individual relationships than just about anything else that I do. Now, there are circles of influence that we all have. And I want to just break them out in this way for us. But Jesus has a similar circle of relationships. In fact, in the scriptures, we're told that there's this inner circle of three that Jesus has this really intimate and familial relationship with. They're brought into all kinds of environments that the other disciples aren't even invited into. He's got the three, and he has the 12, and then there's the 70, and then there's the multitudes, and he's involved in all of those relationships. But for each and every one of us, there's a sphere of influence and relationships that we have, and family is a place that I am making disciples. In fact, I'll be right back. Maybe. We'll see. Can you still hear me? Good. Oh, hi, y'all. There's people back here. Oh, man. I just figured it's going to be a long sermon, so I brought my lunch. Coffee with rocks. For years in my relationship with my son, who was in my sphere of influence, someone I knew I was called to disciple, because there are lots of things I'm trying to figure out. Uh, um, people that I'm in relationship with outside of my children, outside of my family, maybe I'm called to disciple them. Maybe I'm not necessarily called to disciple them. But there's certain spheres that there's just no question. I know for certain that I'm called to invite the individuals in my family into a disciple-making relationship. And I want to show you how practical or simple this can be. But over the years, um, my son, Caleb, and I, when he was probably four, I guess is probably when we started, four years old, um, we would go on Thursday mornings and we would get um, a coffee. I know four seems young to drink coffee, but not if you live in Homer. Um, and I think he probably started with hot chocolates. But I would get a coffee. Um, and we would go get coffee and a donut. And then we would head down to the spit. There was a particular spot that we would park out on the spit. It's where um, the Seafarer's Memorial is now. It wasn't there then. Um, the eagle lady, Jean Keen, was still there. She was feeding hundreds of eagles um, in the mornings with all the scraps from the processing plant. And uh, we'd go down there and we would park on the spit. And for Caleb, on that day, Caleb could ask any question he wanted to ask. In fact, I can remember the very first time, I actually have the little pieces of paper, the very first time we did this, he was so excited about it that he stayed up till like two in the morning attempting to write on these little sheets of paper questions that he had. And they just say things like, um, why, like the letter Y, why are the letter R, why are angels or angles, 
Um, and, and he would wrote down these questions. Like, Why is there war was one of the questions he wrote down. Like, he had all of these questions. He was just itching to ask. And so he wrote them on these little pieces of paper. We went down there for the very first day, and he asked these questions. And we decided in that moment, here's what we're going to do. Every time we do this, we're going to grab a rock from the beach that represents whatever it is we talked about that day. And then we found this little, like, cleft in the rocks down there on the beach, and this went way back as far as we could reach our arm, and we'd just stick them in there. And when we moved here from Homer, we went down and got all of those out of that little cave. And so I brought a few of them with me today. Um, this one, I don't know if you can probably... I, every now and then I have to go back and, and take a Sharpie and make the words big again or visible again. This one was the day we got our, our first daughter through foster care, Adlin. It's shaped like a baby in a little, <laughs> see that? <laughs> and on the back it just says Jonathan and Caleb, wahoo, a baby is in the house. And then we have the date that that event happened and we talked about what does it mean to be adopted by God, that God took us into his family. And this one we were just talking about how amazing God is as a creator and we found a rock that already had like a sea chiseled into it and we just put wonderful creator and then we'd write the date on the back this one um is the day <laughs> augustine blue doesn't that look like a volcano yeah um and let's see here oh this is when i was talking about how he and i are bound together he's my son and i'm supposed to be investing in him and so i don't know why we had electrical tape in the car but we did and we just taped a, his rock and my rock together and uh this one let's see here Oh, yeah, this was the very last. When he turned 18, um, we went back down to Homer and got one final rock. It was kind of like the send-off into manhood. I'm still like, I know he's going to get there eventually. So I'm just kidding. He's married now. Um, uh, that Jonathan and Caleb, this is just a few of them. Oh, this one, um, we were talking about how his life is just a blank slate He's got this opportunity to write God's story on his life and that he could start fresh and clean all over again no matter what had happened in life. And so it's just a bunch of blank lines, says Caleb Walker, and then here's where he's going to write the story of his life. I, I brought these here for this reason, because that's how simple disciple-making relationships can be. We didn't hit every Thursday. We missed lots of Thursdays along the way, but... All I was doing was making myself available to listen, to answer questions. Sometimes he didn't have anything. Sometimes we just talked about um, uh, naming all of the bays, you know, across from Kachemak or naming the mountain peaks or those kinds of things. But more often than not, there were things that were rolling around in his heart and his head. I didn't show up with a curriculum. We didn't even have right now media then. Like We didn't watch a video series together or read through a particular book together. We just shared life together. I invited an individual, someone I had relationship with, I had influence with, into this. You have those relationships. I haven't just done this with my son. I've done it with others also. But I'm just telling you, it's not rocket science. It's giving away what's been given to you. And you want to experience the power and the presence of the spirit of the living God in your life? Jump into his mission and you will. You'll experience things you won't find at another conference or another worship service or another online event. You'll experience the presence and the power of the Jesus who invited you into this journey. Disciple-making is invitational. Disciple-making is individual. The third one is this. Disciple-making is intentional. Intentional. For a long time, we had sort of this um, pursuit of relationships in the church, and we called it friendship evangelism. Anybody remember the whole friendship evangelism movement? Um, it was a little bit like Amway, you know, the whole quick star. We lived in Grand Rapids, my wife and I, for a while, and um, you would be in an elevator in town, and somebody else would jump in the elevator, and then they'd look over at you, and they'd be like, do I know you from somewhere? And you knew. As soon as that started... 
that before you knew it, you were going to be sitting in a coffee shop with a napkin and they were going to be drawing out the pyramid and how you could make millions of dollars off of all of your friends and neighbors by just getting them to sign up for Amway products, right? That's, that's where this was headed. But we sort of took this approach in the church that I'm going to build relationship with you but not tell you why I'm engaging in this relationship until the time was right. And then I would pop the question, right? Hey, I... Uh, Noticed you also have a pretty sweet beard. <laughs> I'd love to sit and chat about beards and growing beards and beard manicuring. Like, like we just found weird things to connect with people over, but our real intention from the beginning was to have a conversation about Jesus at some point. And here's what I discovered over the years is that that moment became more and more awkward to engage in the longer I was in relationship with this person, but no intentionality. Here's what I notice in Jesus' relationship with his disciples. He makes no qualms about his intentions. He invites individuals into an intentional relationship. Now, when I've done this with people who are far from Christ, like the barista Colades, and I've just said to them, hey, listen, I know you probably have questions about what Christians do and don't think, and you know that I'm a pastor, and I would love to make myself available to you to answer any of those questions or to just talk about leadership principles. If that's something you're interested in, I'd love to sit down and grab coffee a few times and see where this goes. Here's, here's the shocker, and I discovered this when I was working as a cub carpenter in Oklahoma for a union company around a bunch of really crusty old guys. I mean, those guys were probably, well, my age now. I was going through these Bible school classes, and at some point it dawned on me that I should be evangelizing. I should be like, sharing the gospel with people, but I didn't know how to do it. And I just heard the Lord say to me, Jonathan, why don't you just knock on the door? Why don't you just engage in a spiritual conversation and see where it goes? Okay, I can do that. So I tried little things like, um, so did you grow up in church? Which is a pretty safe question because I was living in, well, Oklahoma, the Bible Belt. <laughs> like, you weren't a human if you didn't grow up in church, even if you didn't go to church at all. Now, did you grow up in church? And here's what I found. Literally, nine times out of ten, just asking a remotely spiritual question immediately led into a deep spiritual conversation. This is what I learned all the way back then, and I've had it confirmed over and over and over again in my life. It is not people who are far from Christ who are afraid of spiritual conversations. It's us. We live in a world of people who are longing to engage in meaningful, deep spiritual conversation, and they're not afraid of it. We're terrified of the conversation. We've been told that nobody wants to talk about those things. I'll never forget my friend Jason Leininger. He was a Wesleyan pastor, but he wore one of the little collars, you know, like a Catholic collar. Uh, and he had all kinds of different colors. He had pink ones and blue ones. And I used to pick at him all the time because we were good friends. And, well, that's what friends do. Jason, why are you always wearing the collars around, man? Like, nobody wears those. And he's like, I know. He said, Jonathan, you can't imagine how many spiritual conversations I have in a day because people know they can have one with me by this. So I'll be at the post office, I'll be at the grocery store, and people will ask me spiritual questions just because they can identify that I'm a person. They could ask a spiritual question of people want to talk about spiritual things. They don't want to be berated. They don't want to engage in debate. But they are longing to have spiritual conversation. And all I'm doing is inviting an individual into an intentional relationship. And over and over again, both in the church and outside the church, they say yes. Matthew chapter 4, Jesus is walking on the shore, and I love this. He tells them right in the very outset of his relationship with them, throw away your nets, leave dad, I'm going to take you on a journey, and here's what we're going to do. This is at the very beginning of the relationship. I'm going to teach you how to fish for people like how to draw people into the kingdom. He begins the relationship with his disciples intentionally. 2 Timothy chapter 2 
Timothy, Paul writing to a young man, he's discipled. My dear son, be strong through the grace that God gives you in Christ Jesus. You've heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now here's what I want you to do, Timothy. Here's my intention with you. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. Which brings me to the last characteristic I see of a disciple-making relationship and this approach that Jesus has with his disciples. What I would believe the disciples understood him to be saying when he says, go and make disciples. Disciple-making is invitational, it's individual, it's intentional, but it's also incarnational. Speaking of words that aren't real words, if you type this one in, you'll get a little red line under it, but I don't care. It's such a great word to capture what actually is happening with Jesus. Now maybe you're in this room and you're thinking to yourself, I don't have any business discipling anybody. Like if you knew what was going on in my life, you would not be telling me to go invest in other people. Here's the definition of incarnation. Embodiment, personification, a living being embodying a deity or spirit. Jesus is the incarnation of the Father, but you and I, does that sound familiar at all? Like you're filled with the Holy Spirit. You are to be walking in step with the Spirit. We're to be living lives that are an incarnation of the person of Jesus. And what's interesting to me is that this is exactly what Jesus does as well. In fact, if you'll take a look at it, in John chapter 5, verse 19. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do what? The Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does Likewise, you and I are invited to step into this mission of making disciples not because we're so great, not because you've got it all figured out, not because you memorize the books of the Bible, not because you know the Ten Commandments, not because you memorize chapter, chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, but because you're watching Jesus. Here's literally what Jesus is saying. He's saying, I'm inviting you to follow me as I follow the Father. It's the same thing that Paul says to Timothy and others. I'm inviting you to follow me as I follow the Father. I'm not inviting you to follow me because I have it all figured out. I'm inviting you to come and follow me as we follow the leading of the Father. As I live out the life of Christ in my family, in my day-to-day life, in the workplace, in my employment, as I live out the life of Christ, I'm inviting you to come and join me on that journey. And when I get it wrong, because I will sometimes, when I get it wrong, then I'll repent. Because that's just as important as you watching me get it right. That's the invitation Maybe you're sitting here thinking, if you only knew how messed up I am, you wouldn't be saying, go make disciples. I just want to tell you, I didn't say it. Jesus did. It's his mission, not mine. I don't have to make up for anything. All I'm doing is saying, I'm inviting you to join him in the very thing that he called every person in this room to engage in. Which brings me back to the beginning Maybe you're feeling disqualified, like you're not good enough, like you shouldn't be stepping into this. Peter has this very exact same moment. In fact, Peter is going to deny the Lord three times in front of a crowd of people in the face of a little girl who's asking him a question. You can only imagine how terrible he's feeling. And then Jesus is resurrected from the dead. He's appeared to them on several occasions, but now they haven't seen him for a while, and Peter's at a loss as to what to do. And so Peter says to the other disciples while they're by the Sea of Galilee, let's just go fishing. Like, I know how to do that. Let's just, let's go back and do 
what I already know how to do because I don't know what to do now. And they're out on the water and they're fishing and fishing. And apparently they weren't very good fishermen because there's only the second account we have. And in this account, they caught nothing again. And Jesus shows up on the beach and they don't recognize him. They don't know who he is. And he says, hey, have you guys caught anything? No, we haven't caught anything. And then he says, why don't you try casting your net on the other side? And you think a light bulb would go off at this moment, but it doesn't. So they cast the net on the other side and the net is full of fish. And this is the light bulb moment for Peter. He's like, it's Jesus. And impulsive Peter like takes off his garments. He dives into the water. He heads to the beach and he just wants to be near Jesus. And he gets up there to Jesus. And Jesus asks him a question, the same question three times. He uses a different word for love, but I don't think that's what the conversation is really about. He says to Peter, Peter, do you love me? Oh, Lord, you know I love you. you. Feed my sheep. Hey, Peter, do you love me? Oh, Lord, you know that I love you. Feed my sheep. Then he asks him a third time. How many times did Peter deny the Lord? He asks him a third time, and it says that Peter, because he asked him the third time, begins to weep. Peter, do you love me? You know what the Lord's doing in this moment? is he is making it abundantly clear to Peter that his failures don't define him. You know, Peter, that moment you lost faith? You know that moment you denied me three times in the midst and the heat of the battle and the crisis in that moment? Peter, you know that moment? That doesn't define you. The mission is still for you. We're okay. That is resolved. It's taken care of. It was already covered by the cross. It isn't what defines you, Peter. What will define you is if you say yes to the invitation I've extended to you. Peter, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go invite individuals into intentional relationship in which you're just going to incarnate the life of Christ in front of them. That's the mission of disciple-making. That's what we mean as a church when we say, lead others. Invite individuals into intentional relationship in which you're going to just incarnate the life of Christ in front of them. I want to invite the worship team to come. Here's the power of an invitation. This research came out just a few years back because I think most of us believe that the world is headed to hell in a handbasket and whatever's happening on TV must be what's happening in my neighborhood and it simply isn't true. There's a study done on invitation, inviting people to church, that simple act of saying, hey, would you like to go to church with me? The study revealed that 63% of Americans are willing to receive information about a local church from a family member, and 56% are, are willing to receive it from a friend or neighbor. The message is clear that the unchurched are open to conversations about church. Much to the surprise of the chicken little crowd, people are still going to church, and more people would attend if given one simple thing, an invitation. I would just clarify that with this statement. I don't care if they ever show up in this building because the mission to make disciples doesn't mean they have to show up in this room. And this is what I love about our church because I can look around this room right now and I know many stories of where you're already doing this. You've extended an invitation to an individual and to an intentional relationship and what you're planning on doing is just living out the life of Jesus in front of them. But what if you made it a little bit more distinct. Here's why I want to connect. Because I believe that Jesus has a plan. I believe he has a mission for your life. I believe he's invited you into the exact same thing I've been invited into, and I'm discovering a way forward in my relationships, in my relationship with God, and the power that I need for daily life, and I want to introduce you to that. Would you be interested in getting together and talking about spiritual life? I'll share the things I have learned along the way. I'll listen and answer questions as best I can. I won't have all the answers, but we can go find them together because I know Jesus has all the answers. What would it look like if just the people in this room 
took the mission seriously to go and make disciples. Thank you for listening. For more of our podcasts and to discover how you can connect, visit us at churchak.org or download our Church on the Rock AK app from either iTunes or Google Play. Thank you.